we'll record this session and we can share it with uh, with others as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So hi, Erica. Hello, Michael. So let's see here. Get into my presentation here. Uh, there we go. My computer is acting very slow. Come on. Well, we can see it. Yeah. Well, there we go. <laughs> I don't know what it is. So, um, I I don't know how far you got, Ted, in terms of of what it, what had happened. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that we really want to do with this is, is be able to capitalize on uh, the potential. Um, there's some tremendous uh, learning potential here in terms of what has happened and where we can go with it and really get kids involved in, in very meaningful ways. Um, so we're kind of looking at three main responses to this question of, okay, what's happened to our, to our plants? What went wrong? Um, how can we mitigate that? Is there something we can do differently? Um, is there something we can change to the, the lab themselves? Um, or do we need to change entirely what we're, what we're trying to, to, to work with? Um, so ideally, you want to put this up to, to your students um, as to, in terms of what they would like to do with it. Um, so there's our, our dead plants. <laughs> they're so, they're so ghostly, Ted. Mm. They just, we can see they've just totally lost their, their, uh, uh, chlorophyll. Yep. Um, and this was the central one. If you go back and look at the data, that was the, that was the, the hardy survivor for a long time. Um, but it has, it has obviously since perished as well. Um, and this last piece, are we asking the right questions? Sometimes we're not even going for the right question. Um, and so that's really a piece to kind of narrow down. Um, you know, what can we change about what's on orbit? Uh, is that possible um, within, you know, what, what our parameters are? So, um, so option one, we can try to simulate what we're doing on station, or what we're trying to do on station here on earth. And, um, I don't know if you have the, the uh, Kleinostat accessible, Ted. That would be yeah, cool. Yeah, I've got to walk okay. over there right now. All right. Um, so it looks a little one, different today. We ran a little cover on it. but Okay. Um, one of the things that's being added to the ExoLab um, platform is the ability oh. to search and sort the data so that we can, we can look at all, pull out all the schools that have a certain light frequency or intensity, um, a certain photo period, and then look to see what those effects are, if there's any consistencies across the board. Um, so really looking at the network data, because we've got about 80 schools. So that's a pretty good data set. Um, a second option, and then if you're trying to figure out what those variables are and how they might affect plant growth, look at the, at the plants that are growing in each of those labs, which ones seem to be doing better than others. Um, can we, is it, is it a matter of intensity? What kinds of temperatures, humidities, carbon dioxide levels are they running? Um, or, we could actually try to simulate microgravity. And one device that um, can be used for that is a Kleinostat. So of course we could do a drop tower, but that only gives us a few seconds of, of, of uh, microgravity. Um, we could do para uh, parabolic flights, but again, only a few, few seconds, maybe a minute or so. Um, and uh, New Shepard's not quite there yet, but that's still only, what, about a minute and a half? Two uh, minutes? Could, almost four minutes, actually. Was oh, it almost four minutes? Okay. Yeah. yeah, three and a half minutes thereabouts. Yeah, but still not long enough for a plant growth experiment. Um, so right now, what we have as the, the best option is what's called a Kleinostat. And the mechanics of it are kind of interesting. And this is something that you could actually kind of talk through with your students. I've done this with my fourth graders that they, they said, you know, can we, can we simulate microgravity? They were really trying to figure that out. And after looking at how the plants were responding to gravity, really seeing that the roots were oriented, orienting based on um, the, what, what was down, 
Um, and they did that by taking um, germination chambers and letting them grow for a couple of days and then rotating them 90 degrees and seeing where the um, roots went, how they changed the directions. They also tried um, orienting the seeds before they germinated in each of the four different directions with the hilum up, down, left, and right. And um, seeing that the, the, the radicals always came, if they, even if the hilum was at the tight, top, the radical came out and then did a U-turn down toward the bottom. Um, so the, the idea they came up with was exactly what a clinostat does. They thought, well, what if we keep rotating this? We're, you know, we're only doing it a quarter of a turn every few days, but what if we just kept that constantly rotating? The plants wouldn't know which direction gravity was coming from. And that's kind of the idea. Um, so I don't know, can you, do you have it there that we can Yeah, show? if you yeah. Uh, take your screen off share, then I can turn yep. on, on the computer okay. easily. We go off. All right. Um, I'm so, just waiting for this to. All right. So, here we go. So, it's an exo lab inside a little box. And it's on, think about it like a rotisserie if you're going to rotisserie chicken or something like that. We basically got this on a rotisserie. So, there's a little motor right there. It's rotating a single revolution uh, per minute. And, uh, oh, actually, we're going to take the lid off it. The lid is just on there for, uh, Kareem's going to take uh, the lap so it's a little easier to see. Thanks, Kareem. So what was the purpose of the, of the cover there, Kareem? Really just to get a consistent uh, background. Uh, oh, okay. Getting around. Okay. And I got you, don't have the, you don't have the black cover over the... the There you go. So it's probably a little easier to see now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a pretty sophisticated model. Mm -hmm. um, beautifully constructed there. <laughs> you know, plexiglass, uh, a carriage, if you will, and just a rod going through the center um, and just keep it well balanced. And uh, we had to use some strong ties to keep the, everything in place. But over the course of a minute, it'll go through one full revolution. And as you mentioned earlier, Michael, it's uh, well, we're basically confusing the plant. Yeah. Uh, so it's not the same as uh, having uh, microgravity in the truest sense of the word, but it's good enough to fool the plant. You'll right. see that this research is done quite often uh, in laboratories uh, in different universities. Um, and so it's, a, it's our best analog based on what's happened with our, uh, with our space station plant. Yeah. Um, and there's actually some relatively simple versions that you could uh, engineer and build in your in your classroom. Um, I've been building out some curriculum uh, that'll be on the on the the um, classroom uh, site that uh, I've linked to a couple of different plans. One is using Lego Mindstorms if you have those, and there's another one that um, I built with my students several years ago using Little Bits. Oh, cool! Uh, and yeah, we just used the small motor there, and I think it was the Pulse module to just get a real slow turn. I, I know we got it down to about six RPM. I don't know if we were able to get it slower than that. Um, but you also met, met experiment with gearing it using like uh, connects gears um, to, to reduce your rotation too. So yeah. some yeah. nice, nice engineering potential there. It looks like, is that Sam that joined us? I think, so. is it? I think that's Sam. Yeah, that is Samantha. Oh. Okay. I see the top of her head. Right. Yeah. Hi, Sam. Can you guys hear me? I, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can. Yep. Yes. And uh, we're joined, just so you know, with uh, Erica in South Africa. Oh, wow. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to mute because now I hear a lot of other noises in the background. I think okay. it's me. Okay. Okay. Cool. So you can, I guess, go back to your slideshow if you like, Michael. Or... Yeah. So that's one major possibility. And as as I said, there's... There's some real authentic engineering there. Um, and there's a potential for it to be rather open-ended. And I would definitely engage your students as much as possible in this process. I would not give them the answers. Um, I wouldn't decide which direction you're going to go, going to go if you're comfortable with that. Um, any one of the three options are really quite viable. Um, so the section op second option is, okay, we didn't, it didn't work out the way that we wanted it to. Can we 
re-engineer it in a way that um, the plants would survive. So now we've really got to identify what has happened. And this is a great opportunity to dig back into the data and um, really try to isolate uh, the problems. And definitely the high temperature is an issue. Um, and I'm still convinced that the, that the high carbon dioxide levels are playing a role in this as well, but definitely the temperature is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, what my students did on the last flight is they actually created a mock-up of the Exolab. Um, it's in a different container and I can share those uh, images and it's also on our, our class blog. I can, I'll get those links out for people to, to look at. Um, I may have even posted in the Facebook group. I don't, I don't recall now. Um, so they built a, a, the ver another version of the Exolab and put a, an infrared lamp inside the uh, plant chamber so that we pushed the temperatures up to around 40 degrees Celsius, which is what we were seeing on, on um, station. And they were very effectively able to replicate the results on station in about the same time frame. Uh, we had healthy plants going in, and then within about a week, they weren't so much. Um, so they they've, were really satisfied with that. Um, they verified their hypothesis. And then that opened up the chance for them to come up with just a brainstorm. What kinds of engineering issues could we, could we get into? How, how could we reduce these temperatures? And they came up with a whole bunch of different ideas to test and see if any of them were effective. Um, some of which were tried on this flight. They were talking about increasing the ventilation, um, trying to reduce the temperature in the locker. Um, and those are all things that, that we did actually try to do here. Mm -hmm. But you've got a different kind of situation in microgravity in terms of how heat uh, moves. On Earth, if you heat up a fluid, it becomes less dense. And so it, it rises. And as it rises, it pulls in the colder fluid underneath it, and we call that convection. Um, Fluids don't convect in space because they don't have the density, the, the densities aren't affected by the gravity. So they just kind of float around. And if you generate a heat source in, in microgravity, it just kind of stays there in a bubble. So unless we can get that bubble of heat to move away, we're kind of stuck with that, um, that micro environment. Um, and so it may just be that our, the, our exolab is just holding on to that heat and there's no way to get rid of it. We had bigger fans on there, theoretically would be moving the air, um, but it just may not be picking enough uh, of it up in terms of like the, the boundary layer forces just may be too strong to move that, that warmed air up. Um, and so this would be something to try to experiment with. Um, definitely, you know, you're not gonna get the same microgravity response, but how can you move these heated areas in, in um, Earth gravity, can you use some kind of radiator system? Can you use some kind of active cooling system or even a passive water cooling system? Um, and these are all totally things that um, kids could actually build a prototype using uh, found, reclaimed, recycled materials. I always encourage dumpster diving, go, you know, scrounge around, pull up as many, these are, none of this should be expensive. Um, you really wanna use the resources that, that are, we're generating, I mean, Look at all the containers, water bottles and stuff that, that end up in our recycling bins. Um, we're not really recycling them. We're just sending them off to someplace where maybe they're being looped around. But we could repurpose a lot of these things and, and turn them into um, scientific apparatus. Um, and then, you know, kids have such a great ownership over it, um, making, their own, their, making their own apparatus. Um, so conduction, convection, radiation, uh, definitely with older students, you can get into uh, uh, heat of exchange and entropy and uh, all those other uh, physical chemistry issues um, that, that play a role, uh, you know, looking at that old delta H um, and to see what's, if they can quantify what's going on or for younger students, really just looking at the metrics of temperature and, and are we being effective in changing it? Um, you know, I always run into this issue that kids think the fan's gonna make it cool. Well, what's the temperature of the air going into the fan? What's the temperature of the air going out of the fan? And re they realize, oh, it actually isn't cooling anything. What it does is it, it blows away the warmed air from our bodies so that it feels cooler, but it really isn't any cooler. 
could we use evaporative cooling? Um, the station use, has, has ammonia chillers to, for radiators um, outside because uh, um, uh, ammonia inside the station is not a good thing. Um, and whenever the, whenever the astronauts are out on an EVA and they're around the, the ammonia chillers, they have to do a bake out before they come back in to make sure that the, the ammonia is not on their suits anymore uh, before they bring that in. But um, so we wouldn't want to do an ammonia chiller in the, um, in the classroom or inside the space station, but um, it's an interesting cooling system to look at. And, and at least in the States um, in the 1900s, early 1900s, that was how they, ch they cooled rail cars to ship products around um, was, were these ammonia coolers after they moved past using uh, blocks of ice. Um, so again, and, and coming up with, let's make use of the lab that's on the station. Can we manipulate uh, the conditions in the locker where we can measure the metrics? We can still measure the, the temperature. We can still measure the light intensity. We can still measure the carbon dioxide levels and the humidity. So can we make adjustments? Does changing the light intensity help reduce, uh, reduce the, um, the heat? Um, again, going back into the data that you've got, having run the, the lab for a couple of weeks and trying to pick through that and see where are the spikes of temperature? Does that correlate to anything? Um, and so you're getting into really evaluating and understanding, really digging deeply into data. Uh, what story is it telling? Uh, building a hypothesis and then testing that, trying to replicate those conditions and see, mm -hmm. do we get the same thing happening? Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe some of these engineering uh, solutions could possibly work for one of our next flights. Um, so what would the time frame be on that, on that Ted? When would it, would for pot potential adoption mm -hmm. of an engineering solution, what kind of a time lead would, would uh, classrooms have to have to, to, to get in there? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. So two points I wanna uh, to raise is going back to that, the last slides. The, the yeah, first sorry. thing is, um, is being able to adjust the experiment on the station. Prior to the demise of our plants, uh, we really wanted to keep everything the same so it was consistent across all uh, schools in the network. Now that they've expired, we can actually modify the controls, um, like uh, turning the lights off completely or turning them on full intensity or any other kind of variable that you can think of. And we can do that on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays, and we can initiate or end a, a, that kind of experiment. So a suggestion from the group here on how we would like to set our instructions up on station. If we got those um, today, for example, uh, on Thursday, we would literally make a change. You would see that uh, when you're comparing your plant with the space station, you would see that change. And the idea, to Michael's point, is we gather data over time to think about the relationship between the lights and humidity and temperature and any other variables that you might see. There, the only thing we can really change on, on the station is the lights. Uh, everything else is pretty much set, uh, but at least being able to record what this information looks like and understanding the intensity of light, could a plant grow under a lower lighting condition if there was a sufficient reduction in temperature would be one of the queries we would have. So that's something to consider. With respect to your second question, Michael, about actually getting uh, a engineering design that's kind of uh, come out of the, uh, of the group here. Uh, we're a little short on a runway. Uh, yeah. Since we're near the end of the school year. And if we look at the design reviews for NASA and what have you, I think our flights are scheduled for November. We're probably not gonna be able to make uh, design changes explicit to an idea that we might have. Although what we might find is that the engineering team working at Tango Lab, or rather Space Tango, will be following in something very similar. So if anything, your research can be proven by having the experts saying, actually, that's what we're going to be doing anyway. So right. that's going to be kind of working in parallel. If there was a substantial idea that came up and it was able to be implemented, for example, uh, refrigerated cooling or something like that, which is very sophisticated and expensive. Um, I, I understand one component is like $60,000 for this valve to run water cooling into this system. So that's like, wow, that like you know, triples the price for us or whatever. Um, then what we'd be looking at, that's probably more like spring 2019. But the most important thing is our students and our teachers, you guys are engaged in thinking about it as engineers. Why did our plan expire? And is there anything we can do in this chamber to modify that. Right. Mm -hmm.
So, and I would throw out there the challenge of, is there some way to absorb some of this carbon dioxide? You know, is there, some, is there, I mean, there you we, go. maybe you there's some a, kind of carbon passive. Sink? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can we get, can we get a passive carbon sink in there? So I would throw that out to some of our, some of our young people to, to see if they could sort that one out. Cause I'd like to see that, that CO2 level get down below a thousand or at least near a thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, now we're not going to tell them, let's f- figure out a carbon sink. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll put it all in the equation and not necessarily write the answer out for them, but have them think through it and say, Hey, what if? Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Look at, again, looking at that data and seeing what the problems are and doing some, some background research. What is the effective temperature on these plants? What is the effective of uh, carbon dioxide on them? Well, how do they respond to humidity? How do they respond to uh, light intensity? Um, I found several, several good pieces out there. So it's a relatively easy web search to pull up some of that, that, um, you know, do a literary uh, research um, to see what's, what the scientific community has already come to understand and then you know, val- uh, validating those hypotheses. So that, I think this is a real exciting potential. Um, definitely getting kids to, I mean, you could be just a thought experiment, but the really exciting piece would actually be having them uh, build a prototype and test it out. Oh, there um, you go. Mm-hmm. So um, the third option then is, okay, so maybe we're just asking totally the wrong question. Um, and this is kind of the, the uh, mathematician's trick. You can't, fi- you can't get a proof to uh, a question, so you prove a different question, prove a different answer. Uh, and sometimes that gives you some insight to get back to the original. Um, so this is gonna, again, have to go back and look at the data, see what's happening, and then go back to look at something like the, the Koppen climate classification system, where we could find out what kinds of plants grow in a zone that's comparable to the conditions on station. Maybe we're not, you know, maybe Arabidopsis is not the best choice. Um, definitely was chosen because of its size and because it's self-pollinating and short lifespan, or short life cycle, excuse me. But um, maybe there's something that would be better. Um, and then testing those ideas out, or maybe it's a completely different organism uh, if we want to do some life science experiments or some other use of those conditions. Uh, think something would really thrive at the, you know, 35 to 40 degrees Celsius and uh, high carbon dioxide levels and mm-hmm. humidity's not too bad, right? 30% roughly? Thereabouts. Oh, yeah. I should also point out, this is the, the fun part, it doesn't necessarily have to be biology. So if right. you can think about an experiment that you can run in microgravity, what else might one consider? It, with the restrictions that we have with respect to the volume that we're working with, this right. about this essentially what's equivalent in your classrooms today, that uh, two unit standard eight inches tall, four inches by four inches. Yeah. So it's a, it's a nice form factor. So I, I think there's, again, there's a lot of potential there and, you know, who knows where, where this work could go with the Exolab network. We might end up having half a dozen different kinds of experiments going. Um, And again, the potential of, of schools sharing what they're doing. I think that's what we've really got to tap into and, and um, have kids sharing the data, uh, have them sharing their ideas. You know, my, my vision is we would actually have some uh, colloquia with students from, you know, three or four, diff- six different schools talking about what they're trying out, what they're finding out. Um, and those communication skills are critical. I mean, that's, those are some of the, the real 21st century skills that we need students to be learning. And, um, you know, this, real, this is real problem solving. We don't know what the answers are. Uh, and that's, that's right where I would start with my students. I don't know what the answer is, but we can definitely come up with some ideas. So I don't know if anybody has any questions at that point before I go on to just a pedagogical framework to refer to. Sam or uh, Erica? We good? Okay. So. I'm good. Okay. So I really think of this as facilitating or coaching. Um, you're not going to be explicitly instructing in this model. You're really creating a framework to support, to scaffold and support your children's th- your students' thinking, um, asking the questions, guiding them a little bit. But it's not heavy-handed at all. They're they're really going to take the ownership. So I kind of think of it in, in three steps: your brainstorming, your design, your execution. And this is reiterative. So you might brainstorm something, something, design something, execute it, and then go back and redesign, go back and brainstorm some more. It's not, this is not linear, um, but I just kind of put it in three buckets to, to, for us to be able to think about. 
the brainstorming is really critical. And sometimes that's, you know, with the short time left in the school year, maybe that's all you'll get to. It's just generating potential ideas and then going th and with brainstorming, you never evaluate, you don't limit anything. Everything gets recorded. And that's sometimes hard for kids to do. They want to, they want to kind of micromanage some of the suggestions, but you really want to get the, create this open uh, free association and just let the ideas flow. And you might start out with a couple of kids working together and then um, group into smaller teams of six or eight and then open it up to a larger class to give kids a chance to really think on their own, share their ideas and gain some confidence into what they want to say. But get a list of all the different possible questions that we could answer with this whole situation, with the form factor of the Exolab, with Arabidopsis, with something else, with the problems we're having. And then take those ideas for experiments and hone them into what we call experimental questions. And that's something, a question that you can actually answer. So what is the effect of blah on blah? Um, that's where you, you wanna lead this. So what is the effect of light intensity on temperature? And then, then have the kids develop a hypothesis, some prediction, decide what the controls are, what the variables are, um, and helping them understand the, the real importance of, of those controlled conditions. That's, that's critical. Um, and then from that, move into what are the metrics and what are the, what are the data collection methods that we're gonna use? How, uh, how are we gonna know what the effects are? Um, what kinds of materials do we need? What kind of apparatus do we need to build? Um, what are the exact protocols? How often are we going to make these measurements, make observations? Is it a, a once a week thing? Is it a daily thing, an hourly thing? Are we gonna use the automation of the Exolab um, and just uh, move our, move, port our plants over, put something else in there as the test, um, as the test subject um, or just uh, manipulate the, the Uravidopsis that you have germinated already. Um, and then run what, what we call your proof of principle trial. You're not really gonna collect any serious data. You're just looking, to, with the proof of principle trial, you're just looking to see, can you collect the data that you determined you want to have? That's all it is. Does this have the potential to generate the kind of data that we're looking for? And if it doesn't, you go back into your design uh, look at what you're trying to do, tweak the system. If it does give you the, the kind of data that you want, then you can move on to executing your real trials. And you want to run a control trial, and you want to run your experimental trials. Collect all your data that's determined by your metrics, set up uh, spreadsheets, uh, journals, whatever uh, system you, you want to uh, implement. Again, having the kids uh, take as, as big of a role in that as they can in the, in the design and, and construction of those, those tools. Um, and then take that data and work with it to see what story it's telling. And that's really where the science happens. Um, uh, for a lot of kids, the exciting part is, is uh, building it or looking at the results each time. But the real science is taking the data and figuring out what you've learned. What kinds of conclusions can you reach? And um, kids are often tempted to say, well, we, it didn't answer our question. Okay, but what did we learn from it? You're always going to learn something. And so you're never gonna have an unsuccessful experiment. Um, uh, Edison's known for saying something like, you know, I didn't make 10,000 mistakes. I just had found out 10,000 things that I didn't know before. And it's just, building on each one of those experiences and then looping back around. Okay, if this didn't answer the question we were looking for, gave us some other information, what can we try now in the next run to see if we can um, generate something different? And then again, really sharing these results with the community so that we can get into that idea of peer review and feedback, um, giving schools uh, other schools a chance, oh, that's a great idea, let me try that, see if I can replicate those results. Um, and ideally, I'd, uh, you know, if we can get enough people in one of these sessions, I would love to go through this process, at least uh, the first part, with uh, teachers um, and so that you can then do that with your students because uh, sometimes people aren't real comfortable 
with those first steps and going through that design phase where we go off and we come up with some ideas and facilitate those kinds of sharing uh, discussions. Um, so that's kind of what I would like to see us heading into. Um, we have this platform that is a great way to communicate. We have the Facebook group, another good way to communicate. But I think we've just got a tremendous potential with this community to generate some really interesting data. Great, thank you, Michael. And uh, you know, Erica and uh, Sam, if you have questions or thoughts or ideas, this is a great chance to share them with us. Uh, we're going to, we, this is being recorded, so we'll have this posted on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, it'll be access to ExoLab teachers only, um, so there'll be a special link, uh, but you'll be able to share it and review it. So Sam or Erica, do you have any thoughts or questions? I think that's just the must you find a lot of things for me because in the classroom I was not happy not knowing exactly what to do and just getting the kids to ask more questions. Um, I think I was also stuck that I wanted to give them answers and not allow them just to ask a lot of questions. Oh. So I think thinking has helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would definitely make myself available if, you're, if your class wanted to um, you know, paying me during the, the school day. And if I can, I'll get online and talk to them. I've done that with a couple of the, of the extra lab teachers on the last flight, mm -hmm. where they had some ideas and bounced the ideas off of, of each other and, and kind of helped refine them. Mm -hmm. um, so we can really, again, draw on the, the power of this community. Okay. Uh, so Michael, Eric is actually one of the South African schools. So I think you already try to try to coordinate that day. Right. We're trying to get something yeah. on uh, Thursday. I don't know. I, I don't hear, didn't hear back yet if that would work. Um, Thursday yeah, or Friday. Um, uh, Thursday, I could do it, but I'm not sure about the learners. So I just need to see what they are doing at that time. Um, but we will only be back at school on Wednesday. Okay. Because we on a break at the moment. Got it. And if it needs to be next week, that's fine. But definitely, you know, let's, let's figure out a time that, and the kids can be online if that's possible, um, or teachers first, and then we do something with the kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, absolutely. We'll set, yeah, we'll set it up on this end. It sounds like it might be three or four in the morning on Pacific Coast, but yeah. that's okay. I think what's really important is that we can start connecting the communities. And Michael, thank you so much for being able to coordinate that. Yeah. And the other thing is do it, doing it asynchronously, post the questions mm -hmm. um, and we could record the responses to them or the kids could record their, their, you know, them asking the questions. Mm -hmm. That might be another way that we could do it with the, with the large time differences. As if you were in deep space and we're waiting exactly. for the <laughs> <Exactly. deep space. laughs> uh, Hey Sam, did you have some thoughts or questions? No? Oh, I know you have some. Not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Your mind is racing right now? Okay, good. That's good. Um, hey, Tony, just so you know, Hortensia uh, was not feeling well, but she's looking forward to the recording. One, one of our teachers could make it. Um, well, this is good. Uh, this is yeah. really, this is just the first step. Uh, despite the experiment not going in the direction we intended to go in, we actually think collectively this is opens up even more opportunities for learning. Uh, that perseverance and tenacity are some skills that are really important to hone with our young people. Oh, it didn't work the way it was supposed to. I give up. No, let's yep. try to figure out why it didn't and what we can do to solve it. And so I think Michael's laying out a framework for us to all to kind of think about how we can roll up our sleeves, get our students to ask questions, give them a sense of ownership and control, even though there's very little of it for them, and feel like they're actually providing an outcome that they can direct. Uh, even if it's just under advisement that our engineering team there in Kentucky will be actually doing something else they know that they're moving alongside with them and coming up with similar ideas that should provide, I think, uh, a lot of fruitful uh, conversation and investigation and thinking. Um, you know, having said that, uh, these experiments, I think we're going to be able to run something over the summer. I can't guarantee what it is, but the research from that will be used in the fall. Uh, and so whatever comes up in our dialogue uh, today and moving forward here between now and in June, I think will be used uh, in a very vigorous way as we think about the best kind of experience. Uh, and just among the adults here, more than likely we'll probably, if we're stuck with the same uh, laboratory conditions that we have on the station today, is probably moving toward a plant that is a little more conducive to uh, survival in, in, those, uh, in, in this certain condition. 
So um, there is a short list we actually receive from uh, uh, Space Tango, and we're going to share that with you guys. And in a way, we don't want it to be like, here's your list, pick from it. But if you'd like, that might be a good way to start if you feel like you're really crunched for time. But it could just also be a guide for you to think about how you might direct them toward those types of plants. Uh, and this is based on prior research that was done on the International Space Station with plants that are most likely to survive in higher temperature environments with carbon dioxide levels being what they are. So this is like six to eight plants to choose from. And that might be just a perfect thing to do and narrow it down. Or you might want to keep it very open-ended. Pedagogically, it's really how you want to treat your class. And uh, no one knows better than you what your students are capable of doing. Right. And it's a nice process for them to go through and generate ideas. Um, and, and they come up with a, like a, a uh, I just lost the word. Yeah, paradigm, that's not the word I had in my brain, but the, the, the uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, the plant that's like the, the, the right idea, that type of plant. Archetype. Uh, archetype, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you're saying now. <laughs> looks like. <laughs> looks like. <laughs> right. Yeah, the archetypical plant that we, that we can use on station. Uh, and it might be a category of three or four or five plants um, yep. that may be easier to do some uh, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And maybe easier to do some on station. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, are the plants on a list, uh, Tony? Are, Chad, those those ones that uh, they're safe. Um, they've they've done their um, toxicology. Call it, yeah. I understand that they are. Uh, this is a list provided to us from Space Tango. I'll okay. forward that after the call here. What I did want to do is complex the overall kind yeah. of theme of yeah. setting yeah. these buckets up of investigation. Yeah. But uh, um, uh, yeah, it would probably be good to forward that separately and. Uh, provide that with the link for all the others that hadn't uh, weren't able to make it to the call. And also just as a reminder, we do have the Thursday 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. Pacific time standing calls. And if there's a better time to do it, different day of the week, different time of day, let Tony or me know. We'll change the schedule for you. Uh, and I think we should probably be trying different days of the week. It's just, we just wanted to put something down to be regular. But if Tuesdays work better or Mondays are better or mo Monday morning or Thursday afternoon, whatever it is, We'll figure it out and we just want to make sure you're getting the information and we're able to build a community here of doing cool stuff in space. <laughs> That's really all we want to be able to do yeah. for you. Right. Well, great. Uh, uh, Erica or Sam, any other thoughts or questions? Feels weird coming in late because I missed so much of what you guys did in the very beginning. Uh, we've got a recording for you. Thought, yeah. Huh? Well, I'll have to rewatch it and figure out, catch okay. myself up. All right. And maybe jump in on the Thursday four o'clock uh, session. Uh, that's a general session so we can cover what we had here. In fact, it might be good just to rehash that uh, okay. just for all those folks that didn't uh, catch it this time. Uh, now, will you be sending out the link again, the four o'clock one for Thursday? or? We yeah, so that's a, uh, that's a standing link. And maybe what we need to do is resend it so everyone knows that they, they can join at any time. Uh, it's important. I know we were having some problem with your school district's uh, mail server because you have the dot net and the, and the dot dot org. Okay. Uh, so when we send it out to all your teachers, we were getting some that we're not getting the messaging. I think we've resolved that. Um, okay. But we'll definitely send those links again. And that's a standing link. It, you, it works every Tuesday and Thursday. I would okay. rather every Thursday at one and four o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, just consider this the start, uh, even though we're kind of partially through the, the investigation already. And what we're doing right now is laying the groundwork for 2019-2020 school year. And what you're learning here, we're pretty much taking you and your students right at the very edge of the wedge as far as figuring out real science and engineering. So you should uh, really feel proud that uh, you're right at the edge of uh, not just learning, but research in a way and thinking about how students learn and their behaviors around these unknowns, right? And so it's, it's pretty exciting here at Magnitude. We're really looking forward to what ideas come up out of your classrooms. Yeah, is, I mean, it's a great opportunity for teachers and students to, to be on that cutting edge, to be able to share their learning. Um, it's incredibly empowering because mm -hmm. uh, it, it is going to make a difference. It's not like one of those things where it, kids can kind of smell it a mile away. Yeah, yeah, really, they, want, they don't really care what we, this is important. We need to get the data. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Michael, thank you for coordinating this and your leadership. And we're looking forward to what uh, everyone comes up with here. 
I don't know, uh, maybe we'll talk offline here, but developing some kind of framework to manage these and think about uh, these, putting them in different buckets, the conversations we're having with teachers, whether they're live like this or whether it's asynchronous, I think it'll be yeah. really good for us as researchers thinking about how we can improve our processes here on this uh, side as well. Yeah. yeah. You know how we have the Excel Lab Google Classroom for Loda Unified? Mm -hmm. I think it's great if you could put this in that um, Google Classroom. So it's ah. There you go. That's probably a good thing to do. I'll do that. Okay. So you're running on a Google Classroom platform instead of the Magnitude Classroom? Yeah. Okay. Are. That's inside. Uh, well, they do actually do both. Uh, but the way they, they to have structured, this is Lodi Unified School District. There's 30,000 students in the district. So about uh, we have a potential to reach about 10,000 of them uh, through this framework. I'm sorry, uh, I'm getting, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, uh, uh, that this would, uh, the Google Classroom is where they go to kind of do their overall lesson plans and grading. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so doing we, something's very similar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that interoperability, I think we're still trying to figure out how best to serve that. Uh, more than half of the schools, I guess, use. Uh, 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 I, I, do, I don't think we have uh, much content on that. We don't. We have a framework for that. Or Excel Lab. Yeah. Yeah. We'll set something up, Tony. Uh, I think we can probably migrate a little bit of it and the reference, just referencing it back to uh, the, the magnitude classroom is important. But it's easy in that environment, to Sam's point, for the teachers to see that uh, quickly. Do mm -hmm. they, hey, Sam, do they use it? The teachers? Um, you know that? So the last one that someone posted was October 14, 2017. So, okay. you know, it's good if we have stuff on there and then we could share it out and make sure the other teachers are aware. Mm. Okay. So yeah, too, uh, yeah, having too many buckets is uh, kind of, uh, uh, it can become uh, very difficult to manage. Um, yeah, we'll, so, we'll, we'll look well, into I, that. Yes. As a teacher, if I could just go into my Excel Lab Google Classroom that's just for teachers in our district, click on the About section, and I'll be able to find all this information, you know, all these meetings that you missed or that I missed, I'll be able to find it on my own. Uh, so think about this more as comms then, Tony. Let's take this offline, but I hear what you're saying, Sam. So what we'll do with the Google Classroom is for teachers only, it's more about there's a, there's a session coming up this Thursday. Here's what we covered uh, uh, today. Here's the, the link to that video if you want to see it. Here are some resources that are available, but really all the activities that we normally expect to happen in the classroom will be happening on the Magnitude website. Yeah, kind of a back channel. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can also, also make use of the Facebook group for some of that too. Yeah, uh, yeah, and if either of you aren't on the Facebook group, uh, let me know. I <laughs> You, you are, you guys are, right? Yeah. And Erica, are you on the face group? Facebook group? No, we, no, I didn't even know there was a Facebook group. Uh -huh. Michael, has, he took the initiative and set one up. So we'll make sure okay. to add you. Uh, yeah. And that's a kind of a more casual way to communicate. And it's a little mm -hmm. more fluid if you're active on Facebook uh, to follow that way as well. But to Tony's point, we're trying to avoid creating too many different ways to get information because invariably we'll forget to notify something somewhere, uh, and then someone will want to know why they didn't hear about something. Uh, but uh, we'll make sure that uh, uh, you've added to uh, the Facebook group, Erica and Sam. Uh, we'll create an update, uh, at least where the resources are for teachers inside the Google Classroom for Monday. Okay. And for anyone that's watching this at post hot after the fact, uh, the same thing holds true for you guys as well. Send me or Tony a note, our whole team just hello at magnitude.io with your request and the best way to communicate preferred dates for these sessions. And we'll make sure that we adapt for you and your students to get you involved in this conversation as well. This is a very exciting part of the project, even though it's not working as intended when it was launched. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity for learning now. So we really welcome you to join us. Even if you're watching a pre-recorded message <laughs> from us here at magnitude and out there in New York with Michael. Uh, all right, guys. Well, if there is any other thoughts or questions, maybe we'll just sign off now. Uh, Michael, do you want to give us a nice end cap here? 
Um, sure. This is uh, exactly the kind of stuff that, that I love. Um, this is where I try to take my students every day. So please don't hesitate to contact me, pick my brain. I'm happy to, you know, do a guest session for even if it's 10 minutes with your, with you or your, your students. Um, this is what science and math are all about is, is really mucking about getting your hands dirty and thinking big things and having powerful learnings. And it's, it's really about empowering our students, giving them the agency to make the decisions, um, be good problem solvers, team workers, all those things that we need them to be to keep things moving in this world. So I you know, look forward to interacting with everybody all the, along the way here and let's, let's really get some good, good science going here. Awesome. <laughs> hey, Michael, I, I think we should uh, call it uh, live from New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to do the cold open, right, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> you do the cold up and we'll call it live from new york yeah, there you go. <laughs> wonderful erica thank you for staying up so early in the morning for yes you there uh and we're going to coordinate a much more reasonable time for you Sam, thanks for joining us out there in the central valley northern california and we'll catch up with all, with all you real soon so. all right bye, bye ladies thanks bye-bye thank you